pleasure this afternoon to introduce Susanna, who I know is very familiar to many people, but for those joining us for the first time, Susanna Fullerton, OAM and Fellow of the Royal Society of New South Wales, President of the Jane Austen Society of Australia and many other literary societies, including Dylan Thomas and the Kipling Society and my absolute favourite, the Lady Patroness of the Georgette Heyer Society. Thank you, Susanna, for giving your talk to us this evening. Susanna has been leading ASA tours since 2003, so she's well over the 20-year mark. They've been to different parts of England, to Ireland, to Scotland, to France, to Italy, to Scandinavia, to the USA, to Canada. Later this year, she's going to be leading her literary tour to Sicily. But this afternoon, our travels will be through the eyes of two French authors and their impressions of this fascinating island, all through the wonderful, wonderful presentation of Susanna. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Fabulous to have you join us this evening for Travel Tuesday. Now, travelling to Sicily in the 19th century was not something that the faint-hearted ever contemplated. It went through a lot of troubles throughout the course of the 19th century. It was sometimes a violent place to be. From 1816 to 1861, it was actually part of the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies under the Spanish branch of the Bourbons. And there were revolutions there in 1820 and in 1848 because Sicily wanted independence. Then in the year 1860, Garibaldi and his thousand marched on Sicily, wanting to make it all part of a united Italy. Now, Sicily throughout the 19th century had a very undeveloped economy. There was no well-organized tourist trail. Travelers wanting to go there had to ride on the backs of mules or in ancient old carts. They had to take potluck at inns. And sometimes the food left a little bit to be desired. So it was certainly not something that was on the average tourist trail for gentlemen of the 19th century. Only a very few adventurous people doing the grand tour of Europe went south of Naples. They would see Naples and that would be it as far as they were concerned. However, this gentleman called Patrick Brydone did actually get to Sicily. He was an Englishman and he wrote a tour through Sicily and Malta. So that did give the odd English person some idea of what Sicily was like as a tourist destination. But for Frenchmen, this was a very rare place to visit. To contemplate a trip to Sicily was really regarded as a very strange thing to do indeed. So what I want to have a look at today are two absolutely wonderful French writers, writers whose works I adore, and to look at Sicily through their eyes, because both of them travelled there and both of them wrote about their travels. Alexandre Dumas, who travelled to Sicily in 1835 and again in 1860, and Guy de Maupassant, who went there in 1885. And Guy de Maupassant complained of his fellow Frenchman not wanting to go to Sicily. He said, people are convinced in France that Sicily is an uncivilised country, difficult and even dangerous to visit. He fell in love with the place and had a truly wonderful time in Sicily. And the title of this talk, the Divine Museum of Architecture, comes from Guy de Maupassant's writing. He was the one who felt that this place had so much incredible architecture, ancient and Byzantine and Baroque and everything else, that he was the one that used that phrase, which gave me the title for my talk. So there's no doubt that Sicily throughout the 19th century was a backward agricultural country, virtually untouched by the Industrial Revolution, structured very much on feudal lines. The first railroads were only built there in 1860, and much of the island was uninhabited. And there was also a terrible fear of bandits. This French magazine talks about the bandits in Sicily. So that was really enough to put people completely off the idea of going to Sicily. They felt it was far too dangerous a place. They could see lots of Italy, but they didn't need to venture nearly so far south. 
So let me introduce you to the first of my two French travellers, the fabulous Alexandre Dumas, sometimes known as Alexandre Dumas Père, to distinguish him from Fils, his son, who was also, of course, a writer. Now, this year in June, and there are still some places available, I'm leading a tour to northern France. It's an absolutely gorgeous tour to do, and some of the favourite places that we visit are the places connected with Alexandre Dumas. So in the little town of villers cotterets we see his birthplace. This was the home of his grandparents, where he was born. And uh, he would spend his childhood in Via Cotteret. And the town now has a rather impressive statue of Dumas in the town square. He went off to Paris. He actually walked from Via Cotteret to Paris uh, because he had very little money. He found work in Paris uh, with as secretary to a duke. He only got the job because he had very beautiful handwriting. So uh, that sort of helped him get started. And then he began to write plays. He was determined to be a famous author. So his first play came out in the year 1829. It was a success. And from that moment, Alexandre Dumas never looked back. However, he was very politically oriented. And in 1830, he was involved in the revolution in France that ousted King Charles X. So this put really something of a black mark against his name and made him a slightly dubious character when it came to his passport. Now, he began writing novels. Here you can see another portrait of him. His uh, grandmother had been a black slave, so he was mixed race and throughout his life had to cope with a lot of racial prejudice, something he always did with great dignity. But it was around the time that he began writing novels. He, he knew that Sir Walter Scott was doing very well with historical novels over in Britain, and he decided that he would start writing novels as well. And he would do what he called raping history in order to get good stories for his fabulous novels. So he was really at the start of his career as a great novelist and of course would go on to produce The Count of Monte Cristo, The Three Musketeers, The Black Tulip and so many other marvellous novels. So he went off to Sicily in the year 1835 and because of his connections with revolution, he had to go under a false name. He chose the surname Guichard, and he travelled off to Naples, first of all, and from there to Sicily. The Bourbon rulers of Naples saw him as a very subversive individual indeed. They really did not want Alexandre Dumas coming to their area. He spent two weeks in Naples and he was recognised there. So the secret of who Monsieur Guichard was didn't actually last all that long. He ended up, while in Naples, writing this 500-page book called Le Curriculo. Uh, the Curriculo were coaches that he saw in Naples. And this was actually a work that was serialised in the early 1840s. And this first journey to Sicily would result in an interesting travel book, Le Speranare, which was actually the name of the boat that took him to Sicily and which he used mainly sort of traveling around the edges of the country and stopping off in different places. So he was not making lots of incredibly difficult mule journeys into the interior of the island, but he was traveling around the edges of the island, stopping off at different places. And he absolutely loved what he saw of Sicily. Now, this gives you some idea of where he ended up going all around those edges of the island. And he ended up arriving at Messina. And there's a picture of what Messina looked like at that time. He called it Messina the Noble and said it was one of the most flourishing and most gracious cities in the world. Dumas does mention the 1783 earthquake. Sicily has, of course, been plagued by some truly catastrophic earthquakes in the past. And this one in 1783 destroyed about two thirds of the city of Messina. But he was kept busy going to the cathedral and checking out the different churches and on the whole, very much enjoying this first Sicilian city that he visited. Then he went off to Taormina. 
at where a place he absolutely adored. And so many writers have enthused about the incredible setting of the city, particularly the wonderful Greek theatre, which has just excited so many authors, so many tourists and visitors over the centuries. Dumas wrote, the appearance of Taormina plunged us into ecstasy. So he spent a lot of time wandering around in the old Greek theatre, and he also visited the catacombs. Now, both of these French writers were well-versed in the classics. Even though neither came from particularly wealthy families, they had had classical educations. And so they knew all the stories of the Greek gods, they knew their Homer, they knew their Virgil. So one of the places that Dumas was particularly keen to go and visit was a place called Akitretsa uh, on the coast, as you can see. And these are the rocks known as the rocks of the Cyclops, and we will be seeing these in my tour. Now, it's all connected with a story of Odysseus making his way back from uh, his time at Troy and ending up meeting a terrible giant who ended up imprisoning Ulysses or Odysseus and all of his men in a cave. And the men needed to somehow escape from the cave because every day this terrible giant Polyphemus was eating one of the sailors. So they all knew time was running out. So in the end, with various stratagems, Ulysses, Odysseus manages to escape and the giant, who has been blinded in his one eye, ends up hurling rocks after them as they go. And so this is the reason why all those rocks are out there on the coast. They're the ones thrown by the giant that missed Ulysses and his men. So Dumas was terribly excited by this old legend and felt that, you know, being actually in the place where these legends were set, where he was firmly of the belief that they were real stories. So he found it incredibly exciting. He wrote, such is the power of genius that after 3,000 years, this port has retained the name given to it by Homer, and that there, for the peasants, the story of Ulysses and his companions, perpetuated as a tradition, not only through the centuries, but also through the successive dominations of the Sicanians of Spain, the Carthaginians, the Romans, the Greek emperors, the Goths, the Saracens, the Normans, the Angevins, the Aragonese, the Austrians, the Bourbons of France, and the Dukes of Savoy, seems as alive as the most natural traditions of the Middle Ages are for us. And he actually asked a little local child while he was there the way to the cave in which Ulysses had been imprisoned by the giant Polyphemus. So Dumas was tremendously excited by these classical legends. And I think when we too look at these wonderful rocks of the Cyclops, we will be thinking of Polyphemus hurling his rocks. Dumas then went on to Catania, he was very keen to climb Mount Etna. So he wasn't particularly interested in Catania, a very bustling, busy city today, perhaps not the loveliest city in Sicily, but famed for its wonderful markets and a place with some really excellent literary museums, which we will be visiting. But uh, he went there really because he wanted to climb Mount Etna. But one of the things that he admired was the fountain that you can see in that picture, uh, the sort of elephant fountain in the Place de l'Elephant. And while he was there, he met up with the father of the great composer Bellini, who came from Catania. So he knew the composer, he, Dumas had actually met Bellini, and he felt that as a result of that, he ought to go and pay his respects to Bellini's father. So he went off to visit the convent of St. Nicholas, he visited the cathedral, he went off to the museum, and then on September the 6th, 1835, he managed to climb Mount Etna. Still today, one of the most active volcanoes, uh, and of course, a, a name that resonates with all of us for its very famous eruptions over the years. Now, he ended up finding it very cold as he made his way up the mountain. And before he started his journey, he was keen to have a good meal. He was not impressed with the food. He felt the, the inns were very meagre, 
rather depressing places. And Duma, who ended up writing a cookbook later in his life, was a real foodie. So he felt that the food in Sicily was very disappointing. That has hugely changed. And I know that on the tour in October, we will be enjoying some absolutely delicious meals. But he made his way up to the top and was fascinated by the sorts of rumbling noises that came from within this famous mountain. From time to time, strange, unknown noises, which did not resemble any of the noises one usually hears, awoke in the bowels of the earth, which then seemed to groan and complain like an animated being. These noises had something unexpected, lugubrious and solemn, which made one shudder. Often at these noises, our mules stopped short, brought their open smoking nostrils close to the ground, then raised their heads, neighing sadly, as if they wanted to make it understood that they understood this great voice of solitude, but it was not of their own movement that they came to disturb its mysteries. So a rather wonderful picture from Dumas of the rather unhappy mules having to carry people up the slopes of Mount Etna. And one of the mules ended up kicking him, so that left him with a very sore leg indeed. But Dumas got to the very foot of the crater. This is actually an aerial view of Mount Etna. And he struggled to breathe because of the foul, sulfurous air that was coming out of it. And he thought again, using his classical knowledge of Dante, because Dante actually talks in the sixth circle of hell about the whole idea of Etna blowing up and the terrible fumes and the lava all connected wonderfully with Dante's idea of hell. So Dumas looked down into this furnace and he smelt the sulphur. And as he did so, he felt that he was actually overlooking the world of Homer, Virgil and Ovid. So even though it was uncomfortable and smelly and, of course, also rather dangerous, he exulted in the fact that he was really living part of the classical world that he loved so much. He ended up going into this little house, which was known as the English house on the side of Mount Etna. It is no longer there. It disappeared in one of the eruptions. A very simple little dwelling, but he needed refreshments as he was making the long journey up the mountain. Dumas then went off to Syracuse, or Syracuse, disembarking at the wonderful old port of Ortigia, which you can see in the picture here. There he went off to see the museum and the Temple of Diana. But again, the thing that most excited him was a place that was connected with myth and legend, and that was the wonderful Fountain of Arethusa. And he said, the Arethusa Fountain is, for every poet, an old college friend. So he felt that because he had learned about this through classical studies, seeing it was wonderfully important. Now, these days, you cannot actually get close to the water in the fountain, and you are not able to drink it, so I can't promise you that experience. But Dumas was able to go and fill a glass with the water and try it. He found it a little briny, even though the water of the fountain, according to the interesting old legend associated with it, with a nymph, is supposed to be very pure indeed. From there, he went on to see the Latumis, or the old quarries, which he called a strange labyrinth. And we'll be taking a walk through these quarries, now turned into wonderful gardens as well. A place of terrible history because a lot of prisoners were kept in the quarries and suffered appallingly while there. But today, a very beautiful and restful place. And we will there see Dionysius's ear. So in the second picture I've got there, you can see a, a sort of a crevice, which is almost ear shaped. And it's said to have actually been named by Michelangelo. But that is uh, debated by various scholars. But Dumas adored wandering around in the quarries. And he really fell in love with the coastal areas of Sicily. He said, nothing is beautiful, nothing is poetic, like a night on the coasts of Sicily. Like almost every tourist to Sicily, he then went on to Agrigento, or Giagenti the Magnificent, as he called it. 
Now, he did find the streets rather dirty, and there are parts of Agrigento today which are not particularly pretty. But the reason for going to Agrigento is because of the Valley of the Temples and the truly extraordinary Greek architecture that one can see there. And one of the places he most wanted to visit was the Temple of Concord. Now, UNESCO World Heritage has actually used this temple on their logo. So it's a facade of the building that is very familiar to us from UNESCO, uh, which protects so many wonderful buildings. But he adored wandering around this valley, seeing the various Greek ruins that were there. And we will be having a wonderful tour around the Valley of the Temples in Agrigento, learning a lot more about these wonderful Greek masterpieces of architecture. Then Dumas ventured very briefly into the interior. And he was very worried about bandits. He was hearing all these stories of the bandits that were waiting around every bend of the road in order to relieve you of either your money or even worse, your life. But Dumas actually felt a huge amount of sympathy for the poor in the interior of Sicily or the parts of it that he saw. And it was an incredibly poor country. He wrote, there are unfortunate people whose hunger has never been satisfied since the day when, lying in their cradles, they began to suck their mother's dry breast, until the day when, lying on their deathbed, they exhaled, trying to swallow the holy host that the priest had just placed on their lips. So Dumas, who knew hardship himself during his life and was always incredibly generous with his money, did feel tremendous sympathy for the poor in Sicily. He then went on to Palermo, which he called Happy Palermo because he thought it was such a wonderful place. In fact, in Dumas' view, Palermo was a city that combines all the conditions for happiness. I think one of the appeals was that he felt that people in Palermo placed a great emphasis on love and falling in love. He said love is the main business there. And Dumas, who was a lover of many different women throughout his life, found that a very appealing aspect of the city. I don't know if today Palermo is particularly noted as a place for lovers or falling in love. That's something we'll have to try and find out while we are there. He ended up staying in a hotel, uh, which is still there today, uh, Hotel des Quatre Cantons, or Hotel of the Four Cantons, as he calls it. He visited the cathedral. He loved the Corso in Palermo. And he went up Monte Pellegrino to this fascinating little chapel, the Chapel of Santa Rosalia. And he found that a very memorable experience. So quite an extraordinary chapel built, of course, into the side of the mountain. He went to the Capuchin convent and he went down into the catacombs. And he visited this place, the Zisa Palace, where he admired all the streams and fountains which helped to keep the palace cool during the heat of a Sicilian summer. We will be visiting La Zisa to admire some of its really wonderful Arab architecture. So another fascinating building included on the tour. And he went to the theatre. He went off to hear Bellini's opera, Norma. Of course, as I said, he had a connection with Bellini, knew him personally, and he had met Bellini's father. So going off to the opera was something he greatly enjoyed. He went off to Suggesta, another place that we'll be visiting on the tour. And then he went to the wonderful cathedral of Monreale. Now, the Duomo, or the cathedral of Monreale, he said, is perhaps the monument which offers the most precious alliance of Greek, Norman and Saracen architecture. And like so many visitors before him and after him, he deeply admired the beautiful cloisters, the cloisters that have been described by some critics as quite the loveliest cloisters in the entire world. So you'll need to judge that for yourselves if you are on the tour. Now, because of his interest in Palermo, he ended up setting a novel there, his novel called Pascal Bruno or The Sicilian Bandit about a man who is thwarted in love and then becomes a robber, something of a Robin Hood figure in that he quite often gives to the poor. 
Uh, I have to say it is not one of Dumas' better novels. He was a superb novelist at his best, but he did churn out a lot of books, and Pascal Bruno is probably one of the very poorest of his works, which is something of a pity that his, his novel set in Sicily is not a particularly good one. Dumas went back in the year 1860. By this time, he was 58 years of age. And he went there because he was a huge believer in Garibaldi's scheme to unite all of the various regions of Italy. So he traveled on a boat called the Emma, and he ended up writing about it, as you can see from the book there, On Board the Emma, Adventures with Garibaldi's Thousand in Sicily. Not all of the book is about Sicily. The first 56 chapters of it are about the preparations for departure, the actual departure, and the stops en route to Sicily. So if you want to read it, you can find it for free online. Don't expect that this is going to be a book all about Sicily, because, as I say, the first 56 chapters of it are not. But what he does do, because he travelled around with the army of, of red shirts, uh, is to describe some of the battles in which they took place. And uh, one feels after reading Dumas' book that perhaps the other 999 people in the army didn't really do all that much and that it was Dumas himself who almost single-handedly conquered the kingdom of the two Sicilies as he marched with them. Dumas was not a man particularly noted for his personal modesty. So that does come through in the book. One feels that you know he was the one that uh, got Sicily into unified Italy, and he, he does rather overplay his own role. But he did have 50,000 francs with him. Dumas had made a phenomenal amount of money from the writing of his novels, and so he was able to share that money with the army to make sure that food and provisions were purchased. And by his yacht, he went to a place called Capo Milazzo, and there was a big battle focused around the castle there. And he actually ended up watching it from the safety of his yacht. So maybe he had a, a nice glass of wine and he sat there on board the yacht and he watched the progress of the battle. However, it was while he was in Milazzo that he came up with the idea of an Italian newspaper. And this actually eventuated a newspaper called L'Independente or The Independent. He also had with him an artist called Le Gray, uh, and he ended up doing a photographic portrait of Garibaldi. And uh, Dumas ended up writing books about Garibaldi as well. And Garibaldi became the godfather to one of his illegitimate daughters. So that was his second trip in the year 1860, a very fascinating one, and one where I think Alexandre Dumas did play a part, perhaps not quite as large as he imagined, in the course of Sicilian history. So for a writer of historical novels, I think that's a fact that would have really delighted him. If you have never read any Alexandre Dumas, let me strongly recommend that you do so. He's a wonderful writer. The Count of Monte Cristo is one of the great European novels of all time. It is just so gripping. And uh, to listen to it on unabridged audio will take you many, many hours, I think 60-something hours, but it is an experience to be really treasured. So do think of experiencing the fabulous novels of Alexandre Dumas. So let me now turn to our second traveller, Guy de Maupassant, probably the finest writer of short stories in the entire world. His wonderful story, The Necklace, is often held up as being the perfect example of what a short story ought to be. And it is truly brilliant. You can find it very easily online. It won't only take you a very short time to read. It's got a wonderful twist in the tale, as many of his stories do. He was such an acute observer of human beings. And although he did write some excellent novels, Bella Me and Une Vie, for example, he really was at his absolute best as a short story writer. But Guy de Maupassant was also a very talented travel writer, and he was a restless sort of man, so he loved traveling, and he almost invariably would end up writing books about his travels. Now, he was probably born at this chateau in Normandy, Chateau de Miromesnil. Uh, he was very much a Norman man. He set many of his short stories in Normandy. 
And he was born here, if that story is correct, as I say, there is some doubt about it, in the year 1850. He only lived to 1893. His parents were unhappily married. In the end, they separated because the father was so abusive. The mother left with her two sons and and brought them up on their own. A very rare thing in that era. And eventually, Guy de Maupassant would meet two writers who would become extremely important to him. Gustave Flaubert, who was something of a family connection, uh, became a real mentor to the young Guy de Maupassant, and Émile Zola, the great novelist of French realism. So his career really took off when he was staying at this house And by the way, on my French tour, we're visiting that beautiful chateau and also this house, which I've never been to before because it's been undergoing major renovation for some years. So I haven't been able to get tour groups inside it before. But this is in a place called Medon, not too far from Paris. And Zola purchased this house and he would there invite his various friends. Uh, One of his great friends was Paul Cezanne, who loved to go out in a boat on the river and do paintings of the local chateau and also of Zola's house. And there's a rather wonderful anecdote that one day a passerby stopped to look at what Cezanne was painting and said, oh, I see you're trying your hand at painting. And he looked at what was on the canvas and he shook his head very dubiously and pretty much to advise Cezanne not to give up his day job. Uh, Maybe he was a very amateur painter and he could never hope to make any money from it. So a rather fabulous story about Cezanne. But it was at this house in Medon that Zola gathered around him a group of young writers and they decided to put together a volume of short stories about the Franco-Prussian War, which had taken place very recently in France and, of course, deeply upset many French people. So they ended up putting together a volume called Soirée de Medon, which you can see in the picture there. And Guy de Maupassant contributed a story called Boule de Suif. And this volume was published in 1880. Boule de Suif means ball of fat. Uh, It's actually about a a prostitute in the time of the Franco-Prussian War. And it was this story that really first revealed to Flaubert and to Zola and all of the others that Guy de Maupassant was a major talent on the literary scene. And after that, he never looked back. So he made a lot of money from the writing of his stories. He also, as I mentioned, produced novels. Bellamy is one of them. And he proceeded to spend his money with great pleasure. So he bought himself a wonderful yacht, which he named Bellamy. And he was also a chronic womanizer. From a very early age, Guy de Maupassant had spent a huge amount of time in the Paris brothels. Now, as a result of those various visits, he picked up a nasty disease. He ended up uh, with syphilis. This would eventually turn to tertiary syphilis. It would send him insane. And his life ended tragically early in an insane asylum. So the wonderful writing of short stories eventually, of course, came to an end because of that terrible disease. So his novel, Bellamy, came out in 1885, and it made him lots of money. And that was the year he ended up traveling to Sicily. So he arrived there, 1885, and he managed to see a lot of the island. Palermo, Monreale, a train over to West Sicily, because the trains had arrived 20 years or so before. He visited Segesta, Salanunte, Agrigento, and many of the places that we have included on the tour. Quite often on horseback, but sometimes on train, sometimes on cart. And there you can see a picture of Guy de Maupassant in the 1880s. So that gives you some idea of what he looked like at the time he was traveling around Sicily. He went off to Messina. He went to the Aeolian Islands, which Dumas had also absolutely adored. Taumina, Catania, like Dumas, he climbed Mount Etna, and he finally finished up at Syracuse. He adored Sicily. Now, Guy de Maupassant is always a very enthusiastic traveler. But in the travel book that he wrote on Sicily, he gives full rein to his enthusiasm. There are so many superlatives in the book. You you really get the sense this was a man who was adoring everything he saw on the island. 
He called the Greeks the greatest of all artistic peoples. So he loved seeing all the remains of wonderful Greek buildings and temples. He noted the harmony between the buildings and their settings, the way in which the Greeks could choose the perfect bit of land on which to build their temple or their theater. And he called Sicily the pearl of the Mediterranean. So there's no doubt this man really loved the whole island. He wrote, Sicily has had the good fortune to be possessed in turn by productive peoples, coming sometimes from the north and sometimes from the south, who have covered its territory with infinitely varied works, where, mixed together in an unexpected and charming way, are the most opposing influences. So he ended up writing this little book, which has been translated into English, uh, about his time in Sicily. It's not very long. But it gives, I think, a very comprehensive view of what he thought of the island. Now, in Palermo, he ended up staying at a wonderfully historic hotel, which many writers have stayed at over the years, the Grand Hotel et des Palmes. And while there, because he was an admirer of Wagner's music, he was very keen to see the suite in which Richard Wagner had actually stayed. Wagner had died only a couple of years before in 1883. So he was given permission by the uh, managers of the hotel to go into the Wagner suite, which can, as you can see, still be visited today. And when Guy de Maupassant opened a cupboard, he noted that a delicate and strong perfume blew out. Now, evidently, Wagner liked to steep all of his things in a very strong rose essence. And it seems that in the last years of his life, Wagner could only compose music in the presence of certain fragrances. So fragrances were very important to the composer. And Guy de Maupassant was also extremely sensitive to smells. Smells play quite a big part in many of his stories. So it's rather interesting that only a couple of years after Wagner had died, that rose scent was still lingering there in the cupboard and was noted by Guy de Maupassant. He went off to the local museum where he was much taken by the bronze ram there. He called it the embodiment of all the animalism in the world. And one of the things that he particularly adored, and so many writers have done and so many tourists, was the amazing Palatine Chapel, Capella Palatina in Palermo. And we will be visiting this chapel. He called it quite the most beautiful chapel in the world, the most surprising religious jewel dreamed up by human thought. The chapel was built in 1132 by King Roger II. So he spent a lot of time in this chapel, admiring the wonderful mosaics and decorations and really being completely blown away by the experience which so many travellers to Sicily have shared. Now, another thing Guy de Maupassant noticed while in Palermo was that Carmen was on at the Opera House. And he loved the fact that the Sicilians were so musical that almost everybody he encountered in the streets was humming along with the Toreador song as they wandered around. So a rather lovely little remembrance by Guy de Maupassant. And of course, something that uh, travellers to Sicily can always consider including in a tour is a visit to an opera house to see a wonderful opera. Guy de Maupassant went on to Suggesta, and there he saw the extraordinary theatre. And when he gazed at this truly amazing ruin of, of a building, he lamented that people could, in modern times, no longer create such beauty. He wrote in his book, Those men, those of former times, had soul and eyes that in no way resembled ours, and in their veins, along with their blood, flowed something that has disappeared, love and admiration for the beautiful. And he spells beautiful with a capital B. When you see this grandiose and simple landscape, you feel that only a Greek temple could be placed there and only on that spot. So uh, this wonderful theatre, which we will, of course, be seeing on the tour, hugely impressed Guy de Maupassant. 
And then he followed in the footsteps of Alexandre Dumas again and went off to that cathedral at Monreale that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. He did have to brave some brigands to get there. Uh, however, he felt it was definitely worth any sort of banditry on the way. I'm sure it will be safe from Sicilian bandits. And he fell totally in love with this building and gave many pages of his book to its description. He found it the most complete, the richest, and the most impressive mosaic decoration on a gold ground. And it was the cloisters that particularly won his heart. Let those who love cloisters go for a stroll in that one, and they will forget almost all the others previously seen. He felt that the cloisters at Monreale transmit to the soul such a feeling of gracefulness that one would like to remain there indefinitely. Well, of course, there's lots to see, so one can't remain there indefinitely, and even Guy de Maupassant had to move on. Now, when he went off to Agrigento, unlike Dumas, he didn't sort of rave endlessly about the amazing Greek ruins there. What he did was something quite different, and this is not possible, fortunately, for tourists today. He went off to see the sulfur mines, which were a very big part of the local economy. And there he felt that he had entered hell. He described this area as Satan's true realm, a region of real desolation. And there he saw boys as young as 10 heaving out huge rocks, working underground. The stench was terrible. Now, sulfur was a very big uh, production in Sicily throughout the 19th century. In fact, Sicily in the 19th century produced 75% of the world's sulfur, and a lot of it came from near Agrigento. And as we look at some of the other more modern writers on the tour, like Leonardo Sciascia, his father was involved in sulfur mines. So the sulfur connection does go up to fairly recent times, although it is no longer there today. And Guy de Maupassant then went on to the truly beautiful Aeolian Islands. So you can see them there on the map, just off the coast from Milazzo, visited, of course, by uh, uh, Dumas, where he watched that battle. And we, on our tour, will be going to Lipari and also to Stromboli. So we'll get to see some of these truly extraordinary islands. Guy de Maupassant went to Volcano, which he called a fantastic flower of sulphur blossoming in the ocean midst. And he climbed up to see the crater over hot cinders, so his feet got very uncomfortable as he walked. And there he was astonished by what he saw. You see the yellow liquid boiling, flowing. You see strange crystals flowering, dazzling and strange acids frothing at the end, edge of the red rims of the furnace. He also tried the local wine, which we will be able to do today. And he felt that it tasted very strongly of the sulfur that was everywhere on the island of Volcano. In fact, he called it the devil's wine, but he was rather intrigued by his sampling of the wine. Then he went out on a boat to get a closer look at Stromboli, uh, which is still today, of course, an active volcano. He wrote, it is nothing but an enormous cone that rises from the water. On its sides, you espy a few houses hung like seashells on the ridges of a rock. So Stromboli, with its uh, smoke and uh, lava and other things belching up from the center, uh, really it fascinated the 19th century visitors and also artists. So there are quite a few paintings of Stromboli from the 19th century. And then Guy de Maupassant went on to Taormina, and this was his favourite spot in all of Sicily. He wrote, were a man to spend only one day in Sicily and ask, what must one see? I would answer him without hesitation, Taormina. He said, Taormina was a landscape where you find everything on earth that seems made to seduce the eyes, the mind and the imagination. And once again, he adored the wonderful Greek theatre, 
although those columns that you see at the back of what would be the stage are actually Roman, not Greek, and in the view of many critics shouldn't be there at all because they block some of the wonderful view. But he felt that the theatre was so marvellously placed that there cannot be another comparable site in the whole world. So as you can see, de Maupassant was a man who loved using superlatives and throughout his journey in Sicily, he used lots of them. Then, of course, like Dumas, he went off to Catania because he wanted to climb Mount Etna. Etna fascinated him. From its black and enormous mouth, it has vomited forth a burning wave of bitumen, he wrote. He too stayed at the wonderful Grand Hotel et des Palmes. And like Dumas, he found climbing Mount Etna that he grew very cold. He complained of that penetrating mountain cold that seemed to eat into his bones as he made his way up. There was a lot of snow near the top and the mules really struggled. They were sinking into the snow and had to be heaved out of it. He also saw the English house that Dumas had stayed in. There he slept on a pile of straw and he finally made his way right up to the top. And he looked down into the crater, a prodigious and frightful chasm, he called it. But on the day that he was there, the beast was calm. So it wasn't spewing forth lava, which was probably a very good thing for the course of French literature, because Guy de Maupassant's life might have come to a sudden stop had the volcano suddenly decided to be more active. He managed to watch sunrise from the very top of the mountain, and he had read what Alexandre Dumas had written about Sicily, and so he wrote about what Dumas had said of his view from the top of the mountain. Now, he then went off to Syracuse, and it was there that Guy de Maupassant fell passionately in love. He fell in love with this marble statue, the Venus of Syracuse. He had seen it in a photograph, and it really inflamed him. As I mentioned, Guy de Maupassant was a great lover of women. One of his finest short stories about the Maison Tellier is actually a story set in a brothel. Boule de Suif is a story about a prostitute. So women of uncertain virtue were of endless fascination to him and provided the characters in quite a few of his stories. But he wanted to see her not just in a photograph, but in actual life in the museum. And he felt that this wonderful statue of Venus could hide herself and reveal herself simultaneously. She is shown leaving the sea and protuberances in the marble. You can see one on her arm just below where the join is and another one below her, her breasts, above her, her navel. Uh, they were sort of uh, pieces that were holding her arm in place. So her arm, the broken off arm, must have crossed over across her body and been held in place by those two spots that you see there. But he absolutely adored this statue. And for Guy de Maupassant, this Venus was a figure of pure passion. He felt that female beauty just couldn't really get any better than this. However, it's interesting that she is not actually a classically beautiful woman. For a start, of course, she's missing her face, which is a real shame. Her fingers are considered to be very stubby and thick, and her toes are too long, and the little toe is very oddly placed. But this seemed to only add to her charms in the eyes of Guy de Maupassant. It is not the poeticized woman, the idealized woman, the divine or majestic woman like the Venus de Milo. It is women such as she is, such as we love, such as we desire, such as we want to embrace. So one feels that Guy de Maupassant, standing in front of this wonderful statue, just wanted to put his arms around the cold marble and hold her tight. In fact, he said, the marble is full of life you would like to touch it. Like Dumas, he went off to the wonderful quarries. He saw that cave-shaped ear of Dionysius. He admired the quarries. And of course, he did much else on his wonderful journey. But I think seeing Sicily through the eyes of these two 
brilliantly talented Frenchmen who were both geniuses when it came to their writing, both men who adored women, who loved their good food, who were curious and interested travellers, tells us a lot about Sicily in the 19th century. So we can look at those two particular writers who went to Sicily, but there are many, many other writers that we will be exploring in the course of the tour. So local writers such as Giovanni Verga, Elio Vitturini, the fabulous creator of Inspector Montalbano, Andrea Camilleri, the great playwright who won the Nobel Prize for Literature, Luigi Pirandello, and of course, Lampedusa, who wrote that utterly brilliant novel, The Leopard. The poet, Salvatore Quasimodo, another Nobel Prize winner, and many, many more. But as well as those great Sicilian writers, we will be looking at visiting writers. So Goethe, D.H. Lawrence, Edward Lear, Friedrich Nietzsche, Sigmund Freud, Truman Capote, the great Argentinian writer Borges, and even the Australian writer Peter Robb, who of course ended up writing about Caravaggio. So uh, some really wonderful writers to explore on this tour. My co-leader on the tour will be artist David Henderson. And listening to David explain the mosaics, the styles of architecture, and the many wonderful pieces of art that we will be seeing on the tour, Caravaggio paintings and so much more, I know will be an enormous highlight of our tour. So I do hope that you will be able to join me on this tour in Sicily. If not this year, then it will be repeated probably in a couple of years' time. So it would be wonderful to have you join me. Don't forget that the literary tour of northern France still does have a couple of rooms available. So it would be fabulous if you could join me for northern France. It's a very gorgeous tour indeed with wonderful food, wine, artistic experiences, and of course, Course, truly fabulous writers. So I would like to thank ASA for giving me this opportunity to present a Travel Tuesday talk on Sicily and I do hope that many of you can have wonderful travels this year whether to Sicily or other parts of the world. I know that ASA offers so many tempting opportunities so travel, enjoy and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you so much, Susanna. That was absolutely fantastic. I want to go myself. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you so very much, interesting. Susanna. Very interesting. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Lovely Thank to see you. you all here.